Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 368. I'm your host, Matt Barton. Uh, back with uh, for one final time with Dr. Cat. Uh, this time to talk about his game for Cadia, and we talk about the uh, Dragon Speak language he created for this game uh, that allows uh, users to create their own content, sort of like Second Life, but uh, in some ways, arguably at least, uh, much better. Uh, we also talk about the community of Furcadia and what Dr. Cat has done to try to minimize. Uh, the effects of griefing and trolls, and, and to build a really healthy, supportive community of artists and creative types. I think you'll find that interesting. And uh, we also talk a little bit about the uh, combat versus the more socially oriented uh, MUDs and MMOs. Uh, again, uh, I think you'll like all of this stuff. Uh, so without further ado, here is Dr. Cat. Yeah, so Dragon Spires to me was kind of just a lead-in to Furcadia. Um, you know, it was, it was a step on the way there. But in, in a way, it was a separate game of its own. And some of the players who were really passionate about it asked permission, can we take the art, now that you've switched over to Furcadia, can we take the Dragon Spires art and make our own version in Java and add new levels and new features? And they built in, you know, a more elaborate combat system and quests and all the stuff we hadn't even gotten to yet in Dragon Spires and made more of a game out of it. And they maintained that for years. And then they, you know, uh, moved on and just kind of left it behind. And other people have since then picked up and said, oh, I miss Dragon Spires so much that Mech and Motorhead made. And they made a new version of Dragon Spires <laughs> based on oh, Mech yeah. and Motorhead. But still got our original art as well as a lot of new art that, that you know, people after us made to expand Dragon Spires. And if you, if you search around, there's still like a Facebook fan group for Dragon Spires. And there's Dragon Spire servers. If they're up, you, you can find one and get on and play the latest versions of Dragon Spires. They have a lot of stuff in there that I didn't even make that, uh, you know, people want to do a classic fantasy, you know, hack and slash monsters game uh, like we started, started down the road of. Both of these games, Dragon Spires and uh, Furcadia, there's an emphasis in, on user generated content, right? And, yeah, well, mainly in Furcadia, Dragon Spires was really heading more down the direction of being like a classic dungeon game. Oh, or which one had the Dragon Speak language? Yeah, Dragon Speak is in Furcadia. It wasn't okay. in Dragon Spires. So, I was, yes, I wanted to hear more about this and how, and how how it compares to say London scripting uh, language of Second Life. Yeah. yeah, so Dragon Speak is one of my proudest accomplishments. I mean, we have a very good graphics editor. Again, I started making pixel editors in 1982. And I prided myself in having a really good user interface and powerful features that let you do everything I could think of that would be useful in drawing shapes. Um, so we have graphic editors. We have a map editor. Uh, I did some more work on that. Like the last couple of years, we added uh, a little um, short cart, cut bar at the bottom, Emerald Flame. We recruited everybody for our Dragon's Eye team from within the Fricadia community. They were people that were making awesome. stuff on their own and very passionate about it. And Emmy is uh, our executive producer and lead designer now and, and pretty much runs the company while I'm doing all these other things. I still work on Furcadia, too, but um, she's running the show. But uh, anyway, Dragon Speak, um, you know, I didn't want you to just be able to build a map level that would just sit there. I wanted you to be able to make it do stuff, right, and whatever stuff you wanted it to do. Um, but programming is hard. Everybody knows that. And most people don't even try and do it because it's hard and only, you know, geeky, smart programmers can handle it. Right. So I deliberately avoid using the word programming when I refer to Dragon Speak. I call it a scripting language. And what it is, it's very English like, you know, at, at the bare bones level, you have causes and effects. And initially, I didn't have an editor for it. We have our own editor plus a third-party editor someone made so much better than ours that we included in the download package now as an official editor, Dragon Speak Constructor by Lothus Mark. Um, so, um, but I, I just gave you a notepad list of, of these little sentence pieces, and you could copy and paste them, and my documentation with another notepad file that the map editor would pop up for you to read had a little ASCII graphics drawing of Beacon the Help Dragon that Amanda did. She, you know, she learned how to make ASCII character graphics in the 80s, you know, and, and all kinds of crazy. She does sculptures in every medium imaginable, paintings. She's, 
She's amazing. We, she figured out we could use our fax modem and a fax machine as a black and white scanner before our flatbed scanners got affordable enough that we could buy one. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, if you take one cause and one effect and there'd be little places for parameters, I put the pound sign where you could fill in a number for like a shape number or an XY coordinate on the map. Uh, you paste together one cause and one effect and fill in the parameters, and you have a one-line dragon speak script that does something. For instance, you could say, whenever anyone steps on a red pillow, play a trumpet sound. Or whenever anyone pulls this lever, you know, uh, put, put a table on the floor over here. Um, and or open or close a door, or, you know, set off a trap door or whatever. Um, so it's very straightforward, and... It, it was designed where kind of the, the pieces, the atomic elements of making a script were things people were familiar with in the game. The, the causes are things that happen in the game. Someone takes a step. Someone says something. Someone says something with the word bear in it. You know, um, you know all based on the things you interact with, the map and the people moving around and the talking, stuff you understand, and the things it could make happen. Move somebody somewhere, put a thing somewhere, change one thing to another, play a sound. You know, game elements are kind of your atomic pieces you build stuff out of. And when you get more advanced, you can say, instead of just cause and effect, I can have a cause and additional conditions. When this happens, and this is true, and this is true, you know, then do this thing. Or you could add areas and filters. You say, within this rectangular area, do this effect. Like, you know, place a pillow everywhere in this area. Now you have a, a big batch of pillows. Or filters would say only where it's, you know, uh, the floor type is grass or only where the floor type is carpet, do this thing. So, um, you know, it's very easy to understand. It's also built so that you cannot make a crash. You cannot make an infinite loop. Uh, these things are just not possible in Dragon Speak. And programmers tear their hair out, you know, let alone an average person who's never done programming. I didn't want these things to get in your way. So it's designed such that, you know, your scripts will usually do something you can see, even if you make a mistake, to help you correct it. And uh, and it's it's hard to make significant mistakes. Linden script is a programming language. It's, you know, I forget which one. It's based on a real programming language. It's as powerful as one. You know, I don't have subroutines or loops yet. I'm going to add them. But, you know, here it is 20 years. I don't have them in there yet. You can do a lot of things without them. But sometimes you have to copy and paste blocks of code. It would be nice to just have a loop and be less repetitive. Um, people have still made, like, Ms. Pac-Man, Quest Games, Tetris, you know, um, graphic adventures, just, uh, you know, NPCs that talk to you, um, every kind of thing you could want to make in, in an online game. They have made it in Dragon Speak. Some of it could be a lot more compact if, if I were more like a programming language. But two, two things I philosophically don't uh, uh, agree with in Linden Script, apart from just it, it being harder, and I'm sure you could do crashes and endless loops and stuff. They um, also, um, they have this whole structure of, okay, I got a plot of land. Uh, there's like, you know, all these plots of land all around me that belong to other people running code. And, oh, a person walked by, and that person has scripts running on him. So what happens when I'm sitting in my plot of land that I bought or my friend bought and invited me? I'm seeing his stuff, that he, he made the 3D shapes, he did the programming, he made the activities we can do here. Now, like running by behind him is somebody on like a flying surfboard. My computer and his computer, if we're glancing that way, are executing his code. And we're executing the code of the neighbor's plot, unless I have a wall up between me and the neighbor. If there's a window, I'm still seeing and executing that code. So they are subject to your neighbors lagging you or crashing you. They are subject to gray goo attacks. If I want to make something that's going to spread into other stuff and infect it and make it do my stuff or hurt its performance or anything, everybody's stuff is vulnerable to everybody else's stuff. My design in, in Fricadia is very distributed. We put portals to your map. We call it a dream in, in our game. And when you step through a portal, you are in a place that is controlled entirely by the person that made it, or if they want to delegate them and their co-creators that they decide to share control over with, and by nobody else. The only scripting that is going to be run on clients while they are in your dream is the scripting for your dream. Nothing else. 
So if you don't want laggy scripting, and I've worked hard to optimize this stuff. I have the most amazingly huge unwound loop in the history of unwound loops in the core of my scripting engine. It's actually, you know, a bit tough to maintain, and it's huge, but I love it. It's it's a it's a it's a horrible Frankenstein of a beast, and it's my baby. And uh, anyway, um, but yeah, if you figure out what does or doesn't work well, don't do the stuff that doesn't work well. Your dream's going to be great. No no neighbor can can screw with you like they can in Second Life. Um, and if you make your dream laggy and, you know, maybe you get 80 players in there and, oh, it's slow, they're not doing a good job, whatever. Somebody who's in some, you know, um, they're over in the dog pound or they're over in a masquerade ball and somebody else's dream, there's a separate Unix process running your laggy ass dream and that dream. And the bandwidth, you know, it's not bothering to broadcast, you know, scripting events that are happening in that dream when you're another one. And the, the, the process on the CPU isn't, you know, being bogged down doing other stuff. Even if they mess up and lag their group of players, other people are running fast and smooth. And uh, you're not necessarily even sharing core with them on our A-core machine. Although if you are, you probably wouldn't notice. Um, we had two dreams, including our, our current lead programmer, who we discovered at 17 in Gibraltar. Um, he had a build a home dream and he had the most elaborate thousands of lines of scripting. And we actually talked to him, uh, our, uh, one of our designers, uh, who does more dragon speak than me. And, uh, he's one of our three sharing the house. It's me and Emerald and Gar. Ben, um, uh, is his real name. Um, he does a lot of our dragon speak for our, our maps we make in our festivals. And he talked to Treaky about, here's how to make some changes to your dragon speak to make it less laggy. Cause he didn't know you know, all the guts of the engine and how it worked, although he does now and he adds things to it. When he started out, I was live streaming, doing some of our Kickstarter features and, and improvements to Fricadia. I'm working on fixing some bugs. And this kid who's watching the stream said, oh, that problem you're thinking, I don't think it's that that you're trying to trace down. I think it's this because there's these two variables and this one skips over the blank spots in the list and that one doesn't, but you're using that one when you need to use this one. And I'm like, oh, that's a very plausible theory, but I think it's the other one. I trace it that's like, no, it wasn't my theory. And I go, like, it's what he said. And uh, he said, oh, and I know it's true because I disassembled the, the, the code of the game and I also hacked a shape file and I changed the data so that it would work this way to test if that was right and it worked and then I hacked it back the way it was and he's like hacking executables by knowing the opcodes and stuff which is like stuff I had to do in the 80s and simpler computers he doesn't have it I gave him the source code you know when we recruited him to the team I said okay we picked out these five bugs for you to start with in the bug list and uh, here's how to get stuff out of the source control and where stuff is and how to build it and and like five minutes later he says okay I have the first one fixed should I check it in now <laughs> He's, he's amazing, and we're very lucky to have him. And that's, you know, my reward for live streaming, I guess, is we got to, to, to meet and recruit Treaky. He just started as freshman this, uh, this fall, and uh, he's in Glasgow, his first time living outside Gibraltar. So, wow. uh, yeah, he had his first taco, which uh, I, I was <laughs> very happy. I'm a huge fan of tacos, so I was happy for him. But I digress. <laughs> no. A... a a frequent habit of mine, as you may have noticed. Well, I think I've got maybe one last uh, question here. Okay. I think a good way to wrap all this up. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about, you know, people playing these online games, and, and of course there's always the potential for people to be very helpful and collaborative, mm -hmm. but also <laughs> a lot yeah. of griefers and bad behavior mm -hmm. and all that kind of yeah. stuff. You know, it seems like for Arcadia, has done a really good job of... Uh, supporting people that want to do good you know these uh yeah. beacon helpers uh mm -hmm. just wonder if you could talk about that sort of uh you know what i would call something like civic engagement uh, of these yeah. games you know how do you make players into good citizens yeah so um you know there's been a lot of work done in reputation and engines even places like slash dot and you know um Reddit and other places besides games. Uh, League of Legends has hired like psychiatrists and stuff to study ways to reduce griefers. And uh, they came up with some very good solutions. Uh, apparently, they added a dialogue that says, uh, you know, the other players on your team in this game, you know, were they cooperating well or were they like, you know, behaving badly or every man for themselves or being a bad teammate? And, and you know, you click that and they deliberately ask you that first even though that's not really the main focus of what they're trying to do, hmm. to set you up, to manipulate your little brain 
to be in the right mind state for the second question they're going to throw at you. Huh. And the second question was, did you cooperate well with the other players on your team? You know, were you good? Were you a good citizen? And you have just thought about this question in terms of other people when you don't have this selfish bias of wanting to make myself look good. So you're thinking about the question in general terms to begin with, and then you turn it on yourself. And I love the way they describe this. I was reading about this, some developer from Riot Games talking about it. And they say, you know, or maybe it was a third party, maybe it was some, you know, gaming press, I forget. But they had a very insightful comment, which was, you know, you have a desire to tell the truth to some extent, some people more than others, you know, Trump, maybe not much, but, uh, <laughs> or Rush Limbaugh, people get mad at Rush Limbaugh, especially liberals. I'm a flaming liberal. I'll admit it. But they get, some of them get mad at him for believing that crazy stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? Rush Limbaugh's algorithm is transparent to me. Figure out what crazy shit will get you the most attention rating dollars, power, and you know, all that stuff. And then say it. And if it's something Rush believes, fine, say it. If something Rush believes the opposite of and thinks this is totally wrong, but he thinks that's what's going to get him the most money and ratings, say it. What he actually believes is immaterial and impossible to determine from the stuff he says. He's just, he's just trying to manipulate you know, the media and the public to get what he wants. And, and you know, I don't know what he believes. It's probably somewhat conservative, probably not as conservative as the stuff he actually says. He's like wow, this is crazy bullshit, only far out people there, but there's a lot of far out there people who think the government's monitoring your brainwaves watching my show, so I'll, <laughs> I'll say this for them, they'll love it. You know, anyway, um, so yeah, you, you want to tell the truth, you want to report that you're a good person, you know, and be perceived as a good person and be able to say you're a good person, but if you were just a bad person, now those two desires you have are conflicting with each other, I can do one of them or the other, but not both. And it produces cognitive dissonance in your brain. Do I lie and say I was the good person because I want that message to be what the world perceives me at? Or do I tell the truth because I was a kind of greedy, you know, selfish jerk in this game, not helping my teammates? And do I say that and be honest? And they feel what this does is the next time you play, you remember that unpleasant cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. And in, at least in your subconscious, there's got to be this idea of if I play nicely, then when they ask me again, I'm going to be like, you know, everything's lined up. My desire to tell the truth and the desire to say I was good, I can do them both at the same time. So it's a little incentive. Anyway, that's not what we do at all. That's what somebody else <laughs> uh, We were always the game. You know, we decided there were the, the, the combat mods. And EverQuest is, like, blatantly, like, straight from the Dicku mods down to, like, grinding your early levels by killing rats. You know, they, they saw Dicku mod, they put graphics in, some new places and ideas and stuff, but they came from the combat mods. There were also the social mods, which were focused around chatting and around building your own areas and objects, and some of them had scripting languages, too. That's what inspired us. So we didn't put in a combat system or loot or levels because we knew all people would talk about would be looking for group, need a, need a tank, need a healer, want to buy a plus two sword. You know, in our game, people role play, free form role play. They talk about movies, they make friends, they, you know, uh, they, they meet their future husband or wife there. Um, and, and it's much more social, which, uh, and we encourage creators, which helps a lot. Artists, artists can make um, a little side income doing portraits for other players for, for, you know, commission money in the game. Uh, which I'd like to encourage more of that kind of thing. Always, always have tried to, but yeah, having, having a creative audience helps a little to start with, you know, uh, and no game to cheat at, which encourages some of the worst behavior, but we've also done everything we can to like, uh, design mechanisms for how you talk, how you send private messages, always in thinking of how will this affect the community and the way they interact with each other. And I look at any new thing I'm going to do. I say, okay, what are the eight ways I could use this and abuse this? All the good things and all the bad things I could do with it and just assume everyone's going to do them. And again, I've been through this and I'm good at thinking through what could be done with the technology enough that I could usually do a fair job in anticipating, here's all the ways this thing could be. Oh, but if I tweak the interface, this bad thing people could use to like spam other players with won't work, and, but you could still do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to balance those things in the mechanical design. 
At the same time, I got to tell you another story, which, you know, to me is largely an emerald flame story. Um, you know, she's, uh, uh, she's family now, her and Ben and me, uh, I met them in the game and, uh, um, a house full of game designers, but, um, she was a player, uh, her daughter, um, discovered, um, through, through her best friend at school said, Hey, there's this Percadia game. You could try on that new computer your family got for Christmas. And she's like, mom, can I? And mom said, well, let me play it with you. We can learn to type together. And either knew too well how to type on keyboards and I can see if it's safe for you cause you're 11. And so they played together and mom fell in love with the game. And, um, she, uh, she built a place called sanctuary and she had a dream uh, I'm sorry, a, a guild with people who are good friends uh, called the Circle that you could join. I'm a Circle member. It was the first Brigade guild I ever joined. But it became so popular that during the daytime, 25% of our player base on average would be in Sanctuary. And at night, when some people logged off, but there were still you know more hardcore people on, it would go up to about 50% of our players were in her dream. So you know it was very clear, here's somebody to ask to help with stuff. And um, the first thing she did, uh, the contact consortium got in touch with me. They said, We're, we want to do the first virtual world con alongside the real world con, which is in Australia this year. And we contacted um, these two other games. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, there was a very simple 3D online world. Um, is it Worlds Inc. or uh, ah, I forget. Uh, and they, they, they had uh, another like graphic chat thing. Uh, and they want us to, to participate. And I'm like, sure. So so I say to Emerald, would you like to arrange and run our part of, of uh, Virtual World Con? She said, sure. What's a Virtual World Con? I said, well, there's never been one before. So your job would be first, make up what that could be and invent that and make it happen. And she said, okay. Sure. <laughs> so she did that and that went nicely. Uh, I actually had... Uh, uh, Jeff D, who, again, I worked with at Origin and have known for years. He was one of my guests. Raph Coster was our guest at the Virtual World Con. Uh, known him since, you know, since he started uh, in the early days on Ultima. A great guy. Um, so, um, you know, that went well. And I had this idea with Fercadia. I, mean, I wanted spectator mode. And I wanted an attention economy. Uh, these are things we still don't have. You know, and, and might put in at some point. Although I think maybe Twitch TV is our spectator mode and maybe we don't have to build something in the client, but I don't know. Uh, still want voice chat. But anyway, uh, I had this idea that, okay, you know, instead of jumping in this game and you're thrown in off the deep end in a big complicated online world with a lot of stuff to see and do, uh, what people like best, and you can take somebody, they can have a manual for a toaster or a piece of software or anything and an instructional video and a website that tells them how to do it and a little flyer and a separate flyer that says quick start with like, you know, three diagrams showing you how to use the toaster. And most humans will like ask somebody, they know, how do I set up this thing and how do I, they want a person speaking with words out of their face hole to tell them how to do things. That's why we <laughs> still have universities, even though like so much of human knowledge is online. And before online, I would teach myself things out of books. You know, uh, teachers are too slow. I need to go at my fast brain speed and learn this thing and try try it out. If it's the thing to do, I'm making stuff in clay. I'm probably going to, you know, read a chapter, try something. Didn't work like that. Try it like, ah, that's how it works. Boom, move, 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 you know. But people like to be told stuff by other people. So I'm like, okay, when you play my game, the first thing I want you to have, you know, people talk about Fatui now, first time user experience in social game. We didn't have that term, you know, back in the 90s. But I thought... When you start playing for Cadia, I want somebody who's in the game to say, hey, would you like me to introduce you to how this place works or show you around a bit? If you say no, fine, you go explore the game on your own. But if you say yes, there'd be this group of many, many volunteers such that every time a new player appeared, they, there would be enough of these volunteers that there would be some online and they'd offer to introduce you to the game. And uh, I thought I'm going to have another group They'll just answer questions for you. If you have a problem, you know, technical problem, or I don't understand how to do this with the scripting, or where do I find people that are that are doing, you know, like um, Star Trek, you know, adventures or, or uh, Hogwarts adventures, you know, somebody who can answer questions for you. And um, those were the first two groups I envisioned for, for uh, a volunteer program. 
And um, this was just part of my vision for the game I had described and put on our webpage. Emerald Flame, Emmy, uh, as everyone calls her, she had made the circle as a help guild. And they were dedicated to helping other players, whether you had problems creating a character or, you know, uh, lost a password or, or want to, you know, find people to role play with or, or any help in the game they could possibly help you with. They were dedicated to helping other players, which was great. So she says to me after the virtual world con, this beacon helpers program you want to start, the volunteer program, could I start that for you? Left to my own devices, I would have done it years later or maybe never, you know, but she wanted to start. I'm like, okay. I'm like, you know, I think this is going to be more work than you think it is, you know, just to warn you. Oh, no, no, it's fine. I can handle it. And, you know, it might take time and focus away from your 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 guild and your dream and your friends. I'm like, no, no, it'll be fine. It did end up taking, you know, some <laughs> of her time away from that. And, and eventually, you know, after many years, uh, Sanctuary got a lot smaller, but it's still there. And we still, you know, occasionally have a special big events and reunions there. But uh, yeah, she started it off. And in addition to the two helper groups, there's uh, the Masons who are dedicated to helping you, whether it's the map editor or making an art patch or the scripting, helping you make dreams. And they also make dreams themselves for our festival and stuff. When we need someone to work on that, we go to our Masons Pixels. Again, help players with the art tools and they make art. Um, the scribes work on web page stuff. Uh, the bug hunters uh, test stuff and document bugs in the game to help our programmers, you know, uh, track them and reproduce them and fix them quicker. Um, uh, the guardians enforce our rules. That's particularly relevant to, um, you know, how do you make a good community? Mm -hmm. And initially I made all the initial guardian rules and I acted as a guardian as well. I don't do either of those anymore. The rules have evolved some. I don't do that work, but I thought through very carefully, uh, like the silence rule, uh, and it's not perfect, but it, it had its points. Um, I decided you have the right not to have to hear somebody talk to you if you don't like what they're saying. Maybe they're harassing you persistently and you don't like it. Although at the same time, you know, I tried to structure this. I thought, what if somebody totally innocent has some jerk that hates them is out to get them? And wants to report, oh, this guy's violating the silence rule and giving me trouble. Punish him, punish him, you know. So um, all you have the right to do is to, like, stop hearing from them, you know. And they don't have to have done anything wrong. It's your judgment. And, again, you can say, oh, this person didn't do anything wrong, but I'm an asshole. So I want to say they're not allowed to talk to me. Fine. You know, as long as that nice person doesn't talk to the asshole, they're not going to get in any trouble. Uh, you have to warn them personally yourself on two separate occasions that have to be on two separate days. Please never speak to me again. OK, then the third time or any subsequent times after that, if they talk to you, you can report them. And we start out by just giving them a warning. Oh, you have to stop talking to this person or you'll, you know, you'll eventually get published. Second time, though, eventually we'll like you know, block you for 24 hours or maybe eventually consider more serious punishments, which rarely happens. But um, you have to not talk to them. If you talk to the person, you said this person's harassing me and isn't allowed to talking to me. You talk to them once. You're back to square one. They're allowed to talk to you again. You have to warn them to stop twice and then, you know, not be talking to them and then report it the third time. So if you're really trying to make this other person miserable, the fact that you have to stop talking to them to invoke this rule makes it a bad griefer tool, among other things. Um, and this, you know, we, we went through iterations and polishing. This was one of the things I came up with. Uh, we also put in an ignore command. Uh, we thought about some advanced stuff we never did. Like I thought, if somebody's coming in to like really grief a group, which is the best target for a griefer, the more people I upset, the more I enjoy griefing. That's how their minds work. Um, I thought, you know, I'm going to have a threshold, you know, three, four, five people. If a certain number of people use the ignore command on someone, everyone else will get a message saying, you know, you can type ignore so-and-so if you don't like hearing what he's saying. And I said a second through, maybe at 10 people, it automatically starts blocking what they say to everyone else there. Uh, and again, very deliberately, what do you see on your screen when someone uses the ignore command on you? Can you guess? Zip, zilch, right? If I'm a griefer, 
anything the game does. People in mods have tried things like jails that you get thrown into if you're breaking the rules. It's like, oh, you're being a troublemaker here? Here's a special content area. We designed a map <laughs> and a layout for you and bars and locks, and, and you get to explore it if you play the griefer room. Yay, I won my way to the cool griefer place, and I'm here with other griefers, and yay, I got to, I got to see more content. <laughs> no, you don't do that. And if you say, oh, you know, fuck, piss, shit, crap, goddamn, oh, this game sucks, uh, dream owner's an idiot, this place is lousy, you know, Ding, 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 ding. You were ignored by Joe. You were ignored by Larry. You were ignored by Frida. You know, it's like, I got eight ignore messages on my screen. Eight points for me. You know, <laughs> I'm not giving you that stuff. No. Also, what do I want you to do most? You know, if you're in a room with four people and they've all ignored you because you're griefing them, right? Do I want you to say, dang, I can't accomplish anything here. Let me pop over to another map and grief some other people. Or do I want you to stand there for two or three minutes spouting rude comments that no one hears, wasting your time and energy before you successfully start to grief the next boot? I'd be happy for you to, like, you know, make some, some <laughs> unsuccessful attempts to grief people that, that have no impact. So uh, that's, you know, some, some of the things we thought of. Or there's been a lot more since. And uh, we've always been very proud and flattered to hear other game companies will start uh, a multiplayer online game and they'll say, oh, we want to have this feature and this style of art and, and we want to have a community as good as for Cadia's community. You know, we feel like we have the best community online. We're very proud of it and happy with it. And uh, uh, we did a lot to try and nurture it. But of course, you know, we got to give our players, you know, more of the credit than we get. We have very creative people. The fact that we're centered around being creative and sharing the fruits of your creativity with others, I think, also just attracts a lot of good people as, as like, you know, uh, something to build your community out of. And uh, I really want to work on tools. You know, part of our problem is you still, you need to have a pretty advanced skill to draw stuff. You know, writing's easier, making maps is easier, dragon speak is a little tricky, but, you know, people can learn that. But you, you look at, at like, um, I could has cheeseburger. You know, you, you take a, a, a picture of a cat, you think up a funny caption, and you type it on top of the picture. Boom, you made something other people can enjoy. I need more things where it's, like, really easy for people to make stuff that entertains other people. You know, the primary form of it, which is in non-user-created content games, is talking to people or, you know, acting out adventures with them is something everyone can do. People don't do that much. In World of Warcraft, if you even try and role play by talking medieval style, people will like, you know, give you all kinds of help for it. It's like, what are you doing? Just go gank some monsters and, you know, use the jargon and, and grief yeah. people in the barons. What are, you know, do some PvP. What are you what are you trying to act out a character for? And they even divide it up. They said, here's here's just gaming, you know, focus servers and here's role playing servers. And you get on the role playing servers and try and role play. It's still not just not a core part of the culture. But uh, I think the fact that we encourage role-playing probably contributes to the community quality, too. That was really my partner, Manda's. I mean, she's self-published, uh, um, some on her own, some with Jeff D. Uh, Twerps, the world's easiest role-playing system, which fit in your pocket. Pocket Universe, it's like, oh, now there's desktop publishing, same size, like 10 times as much text, and it looks better. Uh, Quicksilver, Cave Master. They're doing a, a Tecumel-based um, game called Bithorm now uh, in the Empire of the Petal Throne setting. And uh, she's been a creator and self-publisher and avid player of role-playing games her whole life. So um, she was the one that really encouraged that to be a big part of Fricadia. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. Uh, should be back next week with a, a new interview series with David Wesley. Uh, he's one of the founders, or one of the uh, original folks who came up with Dungeons & Dragons, the tabletop role-playing game. There with uh, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax, and he's got tons of stories about that era, as well as uh, stuff about the ColecoVision and the Coleco Atom. Uh, he sort of migrated into that after his uh, Dungeons & Dragons time, so I think you'll really find that uh, really great, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show. You're the ones that make this show possible. 
Uh, a buck a show, it's all I ask, and it takes about five seconds to set up a Patreon account. Uh, so if you like to support the show, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site, and you can become a dirty old rat. Get your name in the credits and uh, do your part to keep these episodes coming. So thank you very, very much for that. All right, what about that news for the Matt Cave? So the first thing here is a game called Cave of Sorrows. It's currently on uh, being crowdfunded on Kickstarter. It's not really asking, or she's not asking for that much money, uh, but it looks like a very comprehensive game. It's got uh, hundreds of monsters, 30 dungeons, 15 villages, three cities, uh, full customizations, uh, turn-based combat, uh, complex turn-based tactical combat, 2D and 3D graphics, skill-based character advancement system, and an intricate involved plot. Kind of an amalgamation of a bunch of uh, games like uh, Might and Magic and Baldur's Gate. And I think I even saw Wizardry on the list. Uh, anyway, it really caught my eye. I think you'll want to uh, head on over there and support that Cave of Sorrows. Uh, secondly, uh, this is kind of fun. This is a uh, somebody named Macintrash is um, porting Might and Magic 6 to the Unity 3D engine. And they have a video up and a demo uh, you can check out. Uh, so he's ripped, converted, edited, and reconstructed assets from the game. Now, it's not quite complete, but there's definitely enough there for you to see this, uh, the potential of something like this. Uh, so that's something to keep your eye on. Uh, and David Walters wrote in about his uh, RPG mapping tool. It's called Grid Cartographer. Uh, this is on Steam Greenlight right now. Uh, it supports squares and hexagonal grid shapes. has a wide variety of icons and ter terrain, <laughs> terrain types. Plus the ability to import your own custom tiles. So uh, this looks like a lot of fun, especially if you're into old school uh, pre-in-game map uh, CRPGs. This might be a real a great asset for you. So go check it out. Grid Cartographer on Steam Greenlight. And then uh, lastly, Pillars of Eternity 2 is up to $3 million now with uh, four days left. Uh, at this point, they've going, they're going to add uh, companion relationships to the game. It's always a fun thing. Uh, and they're, if they get to 3.25 or three and a quarter, they're going to add a sidekick. So you can have up to four sidekicks to uh, journey with you. Uh, so that sounds uh, really good. You know, again, I, I'm really happy for those uh, for those guys. Congratulations on three million. Wow. All right. What about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a, a ginger beer. Back to ginger beers. Uh, this is a Bundaberg craft ginger beer from of all places australia i think it's uh yeah here we go a nice little write-up it's always cloudy in a bottle of good old-fashioned ginger beer hold this bottle to the light and you'll see it's full of real ginger pieces i don't know if you uh guys can see that i'm i do see that it is indeed though full of little ginger specks uh, let's see traditionally brewed to a genuine old recipe to release the natural flavors of the ginger. And this is uh, from Bundaberg, Australia. So don't see a lot else there to read, but uh, anyway, uh, this looks good. So let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so we've got some of this Bundaberg ginger beer here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it. It's, uh, you definitely smell the ginger. I think you could smell it from across the room, really. Just a really nice, uh, sharp aroma of uh, ginger. Maybe a little bit of a citrusy aroma, too. And it's very, very fizzy. You know, when I poured it, it was, I think you could, it was so loudly fizzing, I think you could hear it from across the uh, the neighborhood. But anyway, it smells really good. Sounds really good. So let's give it a taste. Well, it, uh, it's, uh, I don't really taste taste the ginger all that much. Uh, it doesn't have that sort of heat uh, they get with some of the ginger beers. It's actually, uh, considering how, how much it smells, it smells a lot stronger than it tastes of ginger. Not sure what's going on there. Uh, it definitely doesn't taste bad. Uh, not a really strong, pungent ginger taste on it. Instead, it tastes, to me, more like maybe a Sprite or a 7-Up. Uh, let me give it another taste here. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like a... 
if you took a Mountain Dew or a 7 Up, a drink like that, and put a little bit of ginger in there, I think that's kind of what this tastes like. I'm going to say I'm a little disappointed. I was expecting a lot stronger, maybe even a bit of fiery ginger flavor on this uh, Bundaberg. Uh, it's not bad, but it's just, you know, usually when people, I think, are going for a ginger beer, they really want to taste the ginger. Uh, I smell it. I'm not so much tasting it. I'll give it one more taste here. Yeah, so all in all, uh, it's not bad, it's not overly sweet or anything, just uh, not enough ginger for my taste uh, from a ginger beer. So I'm going to have to go, uh, I guess I'll have to go 2 out of 5 on this one, somewhere close to a 3 out of 5. Uh, I think it's a nice tasting beverage, you know, I enjoy it, but I just don't, it's not really what I look for in a ginger beer. So I think a 2 out of 5 will do it on this one. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotes about cats again. And, and I found this one uh, from Andre Norton. And I think this is a, a pretty good quote. Uh, so let me read it to you and see what you think. Perhaps it is because cats do not live by human patterns, do not fit themselves into prescribed behavior, that they are so united to creative people. See you guys next week. I was just thinking. That's what I was afraid of.